then I won't focus on you all the time. But no, no problem. I mean, <laughs> I mean, do you think, I mean, is it your view, I mean, obviously you're speaking for yourself, um, is it your view that Kim would ever give up nuclear weapons? After all, partly they're meant as a deterrent against Beijing as well, one presumes. Uh, I, I don't think so. I guess North Korea set very high condition for them to give up. If U.S. meet them requirements, they may give up. But of course, the condition they set very high. Yes. Uh, not necessary U.S. will accept it. Even they may ask not necessary agreements between two governments. They want legislation passed by Congress. That's something maybe very hard for U.S. to do that. Right. That's something they learn lesson from other countries. <laughs> right. um, Mr. Kim, do you want to talk, talk to that question? I mean, has Mr. Trump made things better by bringing Mr. Kim in from the cold or uh, made it worse, do you think? Yes, uh, uh, I think the approach President Trump took to have a direct deal with the North Korean leader was not bad at all. Mm -hmm. Because in, in previous negotiations for the last 30 years, uh, we dealt with North Korea for denuclearization process and there was working level negotiation and once there's uh, agreement on the working level, it goes up to the minister level and then it goes to the leadership. And it never succeeded. So President Trump's approach, so-called top-down approach, is not bad at all. But I think the timing was very wrong. In, in 2016 and 2017, there was unprecedented provocation on the part of North Korea in nuclear explosion and the ballistic missile uh, launch. And there was strong sanctions regime was being built by international community by the end of 2017. So if the sanction could work for another year without ruining you know, too mm -hmm. early, then mm -hmm. I think the US must have been in a better position to have a good deal, good mm -hmm. negotiation with North Korea. But what I'm saying is that the timing was too early and that's why the, 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 there was no progress in the negotiation and we lost sanctions regime, which means we lost our leverage on North Korea. Right. President Trump is not known for his patience <laughs> and his long-term thinking. Um, but uh, Ms. Aoi, do, does, does Japan, looking at these developments, does it feel that the US is, is there for Japan in the same way? or does Japan begin to feel a bit nervous? Um, am I, am I, yes. Uh, I think Japan has historically uh, had a dilemma of being, uh, getting too much drawn into US views, the US relations in global uh, affairs, and also getting abundant. So I think the basic trend uh, kind of continues, but I think the fear for getting abundant is, uh, I think, getting pronounced. Mm -hmm. Is, I mean, is, is Japan making outreaches in the region because of this? Um, I do not. Thank you. I just, it should work no, if you just uh, told it. It's on. It's on. Okay. Uh, I do, um, there's in, in part that, but I don't think that's a starting point. Japan has pursued very driven effort to reach out to broader uh, group of partners, if not, you know, outright allies, but that ha I think has been a constant policy uh, in the last decade and a half. So yeah. I don't think I don't, I don't think I will trace everything back to uh, the policies of President Trump, yeah. although of course he has had a large impact on certain aspects. Yeah. And then just, just to ask others too, I mean, the, I mean, it's not brand new, but there is a kind of new Japanese nationalism um, under Mr. Abe, um, there's been more money spent on the self-defense forces, which is, I think it's a word that, I guess it's in the Constitution, so, so that's what we have to call them, but in the Japanese military and in the Japanese Navy. Do you think, I mean, is, is, is that making others in the region nervous, given the past? I mean, I remember this terrible phrase of Lee Kuan Yew when, when Japan wanted to do, did do peacekeeping in Cambodia, and Lee said, it's like giving liqueur chocolates to an alcoholic. 
which is not very uh, nice, but uh, was at the time very funny. That, that's very kind. I, I think that might be a, a question that's probably better answered by my colleagues. Okay. Yeah. But from my perspective, I don't think Japan has really gone over the right. board to, in, in, when it reversed the uh, constitutional interpretation. And also it upgraded some of the activities that Japan, Japanese forces could do in uh, peace and stability contingencies. Um, those are, uh, I would say, very limited change. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a legitimate academic debate among experts whether this is something that puts a stamp on that something that's already going on or whether mm -hmm. they, those actually represent a fundamental break mm -hmm. in our culture and yeah. actual policy. Right, right. Others? Anyone? Doug? Do you want well, to I, on on the question, is Japan an unwelcome guest in the region? I think for all practical and pur practical purposes, Japan has passed that of, of being an unwelcome. But in Korea, it's a different case, as, right. we, as we discussed just a moment ago. Um, and the, the uh, coincidence of Mr. Abe being in office and Trump taking a strong anti-China policy has prob probably brought Tokyo and Washington more closely together than in a long time. And where Trump sets a, a tone that the Japanese take comfort from because someone is standing up to their big rival in Asia, at the same time, Abe has been hyperactive in, re in regenerating Japanese diplomacy. So that there's Japanese competition for railway building in Indonesia and Thailand and India with China. There's a sense that Japan really is willing to put its money where its mouth is mm -hmm. under Mr. Abe. So it's been a, a pretty good coordination. All right. Mr. Kim. Yeah, it is alarming to Korean people, um, especially if Prime Minister Abe would like to revise the constitution to, to fight a war, then it would be quite alarming to, to, to South Korean people. And coupled with uh, other historical disputes, this uh, gives good excuse for the people who'd like to bring about some anti-Japanese sentiment in yeah. Korea, to use them for the domestic purpose. So I guess that's what, what happens now between Korea and, and Japan now. Yeah, and it's, it's gotten quite ugly, but we see this in Europe too, I have to say, the um, same, sort of same sort of politics. Um, Mr. Zhao, how does China look at Japan? I mean, do you, do you see Japan as in, as in the way? I, I, I don't think so. Um, um, China feel, you know, um, uh, because a couple of years ago, the first time China GDP took over Japan, that's maybe five, six years ago. Now it's almost double of uh, a number of GDP. So for some Chinese, they are a little bit overconfident in terms of dealing with Japan. Uh, but now I guess they keep a little bit cool down. Uh, they know uh, their weakness, I mean Chinese weakness. Although they have a large uh, GDP, because so many Chinese visit Japan, know their, uh, the, the, the manufacturer is have a good quality, then better than in China. They, they under, most Chinese understand that. Mm -hmm. So now they have a more balanced attitude to Japan, um, particularly in past two, uh, maybe two years, the relation between Japan and China get uh, improved. For example, recently, uh, the, 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 the 70th anniversary of uh, people's rep uh, establishment of People's Republic mm -hmm. of China, uh, Premier Ampe make a contribution, also say some Chinese words. <laughs> they get a very positive uh, response in China. Uh, probably next year, uh, um, the Xi Jinping will have a state visit to, uh, to, to Japan. So, um, yes, in some way, there exists competition in terms of uh, making investments in Southeast Asia. But at the same time, they start to cooperate. They have uh, some agreement to targeting third country, make a jointly make investments in infrastructure. I think that's a good idea, good yeah. sign for coordination, not only just try to you win, you lose, such kind of thing. Yes. Doug, please. Kevin Rudd yesterday talked about how China has 14 neighbors that they have to deal with, <laughs> and none of them wants to be an ally of China. China has to deal with them all individually. 
under the circumstances of high pressure relations with Washington, it's no surprise that Japan and China would start to improve relations. It suits Japanese purposes of other That's nature. Right. But for China, it's to break, the, uh, break out of isolation, mm -hmm. to make sure they're not fighting on all fronts at mm -hmm. one time. So it's an it, understandable phenomenon. It's a, a very good point, because I, I get a little tired of people in you know, Washington saying, oh, well, you know, we have allies, and China has no allies. Like, somehow China has no friends. But that's not really the point. China has countries that depend on China, whether they're allies or not. They're not exactly free-floating actors. Mm -hmm. So before I go to the audience, I have one maybe odd question, provocative question. Um, as Doug, you said, when presidents say words and don't back them up, it creates uncertainty um, and problems. Um, Xi Jinping has been very outspoken about China 2050, about lots of things. Um, so in a way, I just want to ask all of you, what do you think China really wants? I mean, what are the limits? Are there limits to what China wants? Um, or is this still unclear? Or should we take Xi's words as a kind of programmatic statement as opposed to an aspirational one? Um, Mr. Kim, do you want to tackle that? No, you don't want to deal with it. <laughs> Just to start the discussion, I expect I'd help to hear from Yi De on this. The, um, Xi Jinping's practice has been to set big rhetorical targets and then in subsequent iterations sort of rein them in. Mm -hmm. He uh, went to the conference building uh, conference called Sika. Uh, the South Korean friends did a lot to save us from a, a, a motion being passed by a lot of countries friendly to the U.S. that would have been highly critical of America. Uh, China was very ambitious of that. At the second iteration of that conference, they reined their ambitions in a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, another thing is the famous Belt and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of rhetoric, tremendous amount of money went out on the first rush, and then people started to think again. There was some criticism externally, but a lot of criticism internally. Mm -hmm. And in this latest uh, summit of the Belt and Road Initiative, Xi Jinping says we have to stop painting with big brush strokes and start using Chinese <laughs> fine calligraphy, and, uh, which means rules, more control, and I, things do change. And so I think you shouldn't take every big programmatic statement at face value, mm -hmm. much as you would not from most politicians in the West. Right, right, right. right. Um, Ms. Said, do you want to respond? Uh, yes. Um, before I come to the question, I mean, uh, may I just take a little, about just half a step back? Sure. I just wanted to um, emphasize that. I can fully understand historical sensitivities in the region, but I think it would be actually wrong to interpret mm -hmm. the recent uh, change in constitutional interpretation as a sign that Japan will now go fight a war anywhere right. globally. And that goes for collective self-defense, and that goes for collective security too. Mm -hmm. Japan is not going to you know, fight a war with you in the Middle East tomorrow. So uh, you know, not uh, over expectations should be, not, not, expectations should not be held too high on that ground either. So uh, with that in note, I think China, what China China wants, I think, can be uh, my, my personal view, mm -hmm. an informed view. Is that it can change, yes, and it can transform as situations, conditions change. Chinese people look to me as very pragmatic mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chad, do you want to respond yeah. at all? Uh, yeah. I guess uh, the John in the sitting the panel this morning, he uh, yesterday uh, to describe the fact, a very interesting fact is also today I chit chatted with him. He he say, um, very interesting, only two major countries uh, never happened uh, in, in recent history, never happened uh, system collapsing, mm -hmm. United States and uh, Britain. But only in these two countries, now populism prevailed. Maybe 400 mm -hmm. years ago is a so-called growing uh, re uh, revolution. After that, the system almost yes. no fundamental change. Yes. But what I try to say is a so-called national memory. I guess play some role in shaping the uh, future direction. Back to the topic you ask, mm -hmm. 
the Chinese government or particularly top leaders try to uh, use this memory, national memory, and say, we, don't, we want to take away uh, humiliation history in the past 100 years. Mm -hmm. Want China to be revenulate, become one large power respected by the rest of the world. I yeah. guess that's probably is, is the obvious uh, goal. Yeah. But all, I would say in past two or three years, or maybe several years, in some way, a little bit overreach uh, in, in, in many ways. But you see, at the one hand, China claim it is still one largest eco uh, developing economy. At the same time, you spend so much uh, resource effort overseas, you should make a balance uh, between overseas effort and a domestic uh, yeah. livelihood. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's something, as a Dao point out, because Dao is a China expert to know. I have to say, in past one or two years, that's maybe positive side of Donald Trump pressure. Yeah. The tone of Chinese leader has been soft, loud. They never say something China move to the center of the world uh, arena, never say that. But that's, I think, it's a good, uh, good sign for yeah. China to keep uh, the modest in Chinese way. Yes, or, you know, I mean, to become, again, as Don suggested, a little more modest. Um, <laughs> but it, it's, it's, I mean, what it in, intrigues me is just, it's, it's, it's what you're saying. Also, China will not be backward again. I think that's part of it, right? I mean, um, I'm very struck by this. It's also, we had, you, you know, one of the great cliches now is decoupling. But it is really fascinating to see China developing its own internet, its own Amazon, its own Facebook, its own WeChat. I mean, and, and, and you know, even with social credit, just creating a Chinese world where the outside world exists, but it's, it's filtered, put it that way. I mean, that's the sort of most neutral way of, of putting it. And, and the result is going, I think, to be fascinating. I'm very eager to see what's going to happen, but I hope I don't say the wrong thing and get denied a train ticket. <laughs> <laughs>